This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kaylee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and trustee at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. However, I need to make it clear in this disclaimer at the start that the views you hear from me and my guests on this program are purely our own as private citizens and do not necessarily represent any institution. With that said, today we're going to take a look at Washington, D.C., or at least what's going on up there that can affect Hawaii, and that's important. This is called a D.C. update, and I have as my guest today the policy director of the Grassroot Institute, Malia Blom-Hill. She'll be joining us from right outside of Washington, D.C., where she is our eyes and ears as well as legs and sometimes mouthpiece as need needs to be. Malia, aloha. Welcome to the program. Hello. Thank you for having me. What's the temperature right now up there? Uh, yes, I'm coming to you from 40-degree weather and cold and flu season. Oh, my goodness. And that's not with the wind chill factor, is it? It's not great. Well, I hope that's not the weather inside of your home where I've caught you late this evening. But thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it very much. You know, right at the outset, uh, you've been with Grassroot, whether Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, our nonprofit, or Grassroot Action, which is our 501c4. You've been with us for how many years now? Oh, goodness. Um, probably about five years at this point, maybe a little bit more. Okay, and you were active with the people involved prior to that as well. And, but what exactly is the need to have an independent voice from Hawaii right there in Washington, D.C.? Well, I think really it comes down to the fact that historically speaking, Hawaii, it gets overlooked. I mean, you know, it's far away, and I'll, I'll be honest, especially in the middle of winter, it's easy to feel like no one in Hawaii has any right to complain about anything ever. Well, and that's why Hawaii needs a voice in D.C. To quote a popular figure, we are a small island in the Pacific. Exactly. And, you know, some of the issues that we deal with here in Hawaii, which are near and dear to the people of Hawaii, like fighting for a lower cost of living, lower housing costs, better shipping prices, transportation solutions. A lot of them we're frustrated in because uh, we can't do everything that's needed from the islands. These are issues that require congressional or presidential intervention. So uh, what does that, that mean in terms of having a voice there up in Washington, D.C., fighting for the people? Well, it is very important to kind of make these connections and these networking um, being able to get Hawaii's voice in because, you know, Hawaii politics is more nuanced and sophisticated than maybe people realize from outside. But from outside, it's just your voice is only as good as the party that you have representing you, and there's very little variance in Hawaii as to what party comes to Washington. So when the other party has control, um, what would be an opportunity to get, you know, certain changes is frustrated by the fact that you don't have anyone speaking for that. Um, we can see that, you know, when opportunity comes, uh, when an issue all of a sudden that would affect Hawaii becomes very much in the news, Hawaii doesn't necessarily have the people in place in D.C. that are willing or interested in advocating for that particular issue, um, Jones Act, regulation, things like that. And that's why Grassroots does have a presence in D.C. to be a voice for Hawaii uh, on these issues that are important, that do affect us, that are, you know, federal issues, uh, things like the rail, the Jones Act, regulations, economic issues, they all flow from Washington to Honolulu. And, you know, it's very, these are all things that we care about that affect our lives. Hawaii does need someone representing those issues in, in D.C. and not just the people that we elect from to Congress, but also people who represent different points of view, the interests of other Hawaiians, the interests of businesses, of entrepreneurs, of the free market. Well, I'm glad you mentioned party politics, because that's important. And although Grassroot Institute is nonpartisan, and we're actively uh, engaged both with Democrats and Republicans, as well as independents and libertarians, uh, it's important to recognize the bipartisan nature of Washington, D.C. And I think you're absolutely right, Malia. If there's only one side of the picture coming from Hawaii, we have fewer resources. At the very least, we don't network as well in terms of solving 
problems in Hawaii that really require bipartisan solutions and the need to cross the aisle. And that's why it's important for a group like Grassroot Institute, which is not embedded within one party voice, to be able to do some of the work up there in Washington, D.C. Now, in a few moments, I want to talk with you about some of the issues that you've been active in helping us with, particularly the shipping laws known as the Jones Act. And uh, even the Honolulu Rail, uh, people might be surprised that we've been a voice for sanity about the Honolulu Rail in Washington, D.C. But, but first, let's talk about the Trump administration. Uh, I'm always amused to see the extent to which President Trump is featured in the local news and on the local talk shows in Hawaii. As much as he is vilified here, and that's no secret, he seems to be the subject of a lot of interest. I read a recent article that was quite interesting that said, that behind all of the vehement opposition to President Trump and his policies from Hawaii, he really has a great many fans who are secret fans of his in Hawaii. Uh, what, what do you think the reason for that might be? How is it that people who vilify him publicly might actually be appreciative of some of his policy work? Um, you know, that is, a, that is a question that I think people struggle with, not just in Hawaii, but through the whole country. I can tell you that... Um, Regardless of how you may react to his either method of politics or his uh, personal style or any other number of things, the fact is that things are happening. Things that uh, people who are in favor of limited government, people who support the free market, have been pushing for for a very long time. Um, the one that really jumps out at me is the regulation rollback. Uh, it's estimated that under Obama, there was about $100 billion worth of regulations put in. Uh, under President Bush II, it was about $68 million. So President Trump's determination to roll back regulations, um, number one, is one of the reasons you see so many headlines, because it's just constant. You've probably seen something about net neutrality, about waiters pooling tips, about uh, changing the size of monuments about uh, banking reform, and even people who you would think would, you know, each, each regulation that's rolled back has its supporters, but it also has people who um, are saying, hey, you know what, this is helpful. This is something that, you know, got passed without really thought of being thought about how to do it. And so it's a much more complicated uh, issue than you'll see from headlines. And, um, talking about the regulations and the monument I and mean, the rollbacks, uh, one of those is a monument rollback. Uh, we've seen the environmental response, but that may actually end up affecting Hawaii fishermen who have been pushing to open up areas for them to, for longline fishermen to catch uh, tuna and other fish stocks. That's one of those regulations that's just part of this massive, constant list of um, considerations of regulations that are being rolled back, of uh, rules that are being re-examined. Well, you know, and that's happening. That's right. I'm going to let you continue in just a moment. I'm, I'm going to interject something uh, along the lines of what you've just said. Um, I've had a lot of people contact me in my capacity as a trustee at OHA as well as president of Grassroot. And again, I'm not speaking in that capacity now. I'm just sharing. I've had a lot of people contact me who are hunters, fishermen, uh, farmers, who were uh, Native Hawaiian activists and, and clearly not necessarily your rank and file of, of the Republican Party at all, who are quite pleased with some of the rollback of some of the regulation taking place, whether it has to deal with the regulations that are on farmers and agriculture or what regulation in terms of fishing. And, and the, many of them actually uh, were very dismayed by the expansion of government regulation, even something that was pr uh, purportedly uh, done for the sake of Native Hawaiians, the expansion of our national marine uh, Papahānau Mokuakea region. There were many, many Hawaiians who felt, you know, that's putting too much government control I into the islands. And so I wanted just to reflect. I'm hearing what you're saying. It's a very complicated issue. Federal regulation doesn't divide on Democrat versus Republican, and, and maybe that's the reason that Trump is gaining some popularity amongst those who'd like to see less regulation. Exactly, and 
you know, I said, I think I gave the figure 100, it was 100 billion. It's actually over 120 billion that were additional regulatory burdens under the Obama administration. And some of that is just a question of should these regulations be passed without the clear guidance of Congress? So, I mean, really what we're talking about in some ways is just getting back to legislative intent on making legislators responsible for laws, not executive expansion of executive powers. And those are things that in terms of voters and ordinary citizens who want to be able to have a government that's responsive to us, that we should generally be in favor of. You know, executive agencies just do not have the same kind of responsiveness as a legislature does. And that's why people who have favor limited government have been really pushing back at this idea of just incredible expansion of regulation. And when it comes to the monuments, yes, uh, and I'm going to, I'm, I always, always mess up the newest monument, Papa, wow, oh, darn it. That's, well, that's close enough, uh, Papa but, Hanau Mokuakea. Go thank ahead. you, Papa Hanau Mokuakea. But, but they haven't, they haven't uh, actually addressed that. But they are, it is possible that that will be one of the monuments that the interior reconsiders as they've been reconsidering other monuments. And it would be to the benefit of fisheries in Hawaii. Well, you know, and that's an interesting point as well. And most of the correspondence I receive urging me to use my voice and use Grassroot Institute's voice to call upon President Trump to roll back some of Papahanaumokuakea uh, federalization comes from Native Hawaiians. Native Hawaiians who, at the very least, uh, don't like what the federal government represents and who speak of something called home rule. So this is not so much to assert any position from my point of view or any organizations, but just to point out that you're absolutely right, this is a complicated issue. And because of its complexity, Trump is operating in an arena in which he may pick up followers that he wouldn't pick up based upon party lines. Exactly. I think it's an example of how, you know, you tend not to realize that you like small government until big government moves <laughs> into an area you never expected them to be. <laughs> Well, when we come back from a short break, I want to dive into some issues uh, that you've been working on. And one in particular might surprise people, and that is the uh, Honolulu Rapid, well, the, the, the mass transit system of Honolulu, which has been iconically the rail. Uh, some people might be surprised that we're actually talking uh, to people in Washington, D.C. about that. So let us know about grassroots work in terms of testimony. Uh, as well as some investigation that has resulted in some headlines recently when we come back from a break. So don't go away or, uh, and don't go outside and play in the snow right now, all right? <laughs> we have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. They had no musical talent and then sat down and kind of made some really nice sound. So we do it. Welcome back to Hawaii Together. We're here every other week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, and I want to say that I'm just so grateful to Jay Fidel, Carol Mun Lee, and the entire crew at Think Tech Hawaii, many volunteers, as well as some of the, as well as the entire working staff. What a great system of getting words out, uh, getting ideas across they've created. And, and you know, what I like about it is that Think Tech Hawaii empowers people like myself who are not necessarily broadcast professionals, but who have some area of interest or expertise. It empowers us to have a platform that goes worldwide and influences not only Hawaii, but places well beyond. 
Uh, today we're talking with Malia Blomhill, the policy director of Grassroot Institute. And we're covering some of the issues that Grassroot is working on in Washington, D.C. One of the things that is so very important in D.C., I think acutely so, but most definitely in Hawaii, is the ability to work together across the aisle. Uh, I love to say a hana kako. It's like the Hawaiian expression, a pule kako, which means let's pray together. Kako means let's do it together. A hana kako means let's work kako, let's work together. Because if we don't work together, we get nothing done. Let's work together to build a better economy, government, society. And, and that's the nature of the work of the Grassroot Institute. I'm so proud that Malia Blomhill is one of the tremendous workers who does policy work. Uh, she's a graduate of uh, uh, law school, uh, but chooses to work in the public policy arena rather than in actual litigation or legal work uh, because she believes it's important to craft ideas and bring them to public officials so that they can run our country a little bit better. Back to Malia now. Malia, do you want to come on in at this time from the cold, the 40 degree weather up there in Washington, D.C.? Do we have you on the other side? Yes, thank you. I wish I could be there in person. Well, you know, what in the world are we going to Washington, D.C. and talking about Honolulu rail system for? Uh, isn't that just a local issue, a state issue, and most of all, a county issue for Honolulu? and unfortunately also for every other county. <laughs> well, how interesting it would have been if it had been, but of course it's a federally funded project. And uh, that's one of the reasons that we took the issues to the uh, House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Earlier this year, they had a hearing about challenges with a passenger rail service, and we took the opportunity to submit testimony about the problems that have dogged the Honolulu Rail Project, and more significantly, for the need uh, for a forensic audit, uh, specifically an audit that focused on the problem of fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, in fact, we, we, that, we actually uh, began to talk about auditing this at the federal level before we launched a campaign locally to, to bring that to local leaders. Exactly. In, in doing so, we're really just reflecting what I would call the public mood. Um, in a sense, whilst uh, various rail, rail people might not agree, I would say that in a sense it's an attempt to restore uh, some level of public trust in the project because the public trust in the Honolulu Rail Project has been sinking and sinking. When we launched our campaign for an audit, uh, the response itself was, you know, everything that you needed to know about where the people of Hawaii are feel, where they're stand now on rail. And it's just a complete a conviction that money has been wasted, that there are questions, that no one really trusts where it's going. Uh, and we originally brought these questions to the Department of Transportation, uh, which itself has had questions, um, which is part of the whole knotted, twisted story of the rail, and, the, and one of the reasons why uh, the legislature had to meet this uh, summer in order to guarantee funding, because the Department of Transportation had its own questions about the ability of the project well, that's to a, meet its obligations. That's right, and, and that's a good segue to, to point out that uh, some of the influence that you and our team had with Grassroots came back to Hawaii. Not only do we see members of our congressional delegation calling for an audit, we eventually saw thousands of people in Hawaii responding to our petition drive. And in addition to that, their political leader is also calling for an audit. Unfortunately, we may not get right away the kind of audit for fraud, waste, and abuse that is needed because there has been a tendency, now that funding has been approved for the next leg of the rail, uh, to downplay the audit a bit. But, you know, the issues won't go away. And, and one of the reasons the issues won't go away is something that you and the team uh, found out. You, you were monitoring the claims that were being made by local officials, by our city, particularly by uh, our mayor, about what the federal government was actually saying was necessary for their participation and their funding. And, and one of them seemed a little bit fishy. You want to tell us about that? Um, absolutely. Well, uh, if you recall, the summer when the legislature was dealing with the whole question of 
you know, how are we going to, what are we going to pass, what kind of taxes are we going to endorse to help fund the rail, there was a question about could there be a plan B, uh, some other less expensive option uh, in order to make the rail feasible. And Mayor Caldwell basically told the legislature that funding had to be adequate to fully fund the project all the way to Ala Moana Center, and he claimed that the Federal Transit Administration wouldn't allow a plan B or anything less than the project going to Ala Moana. Uh, this was arguably uh, made a big impact on the legislature because, um, you know, he was basically saying, you know, no half measures, nothing that would be anything less than fully funding. Uh, this is part of the questions that the legislators have had to begin with. But we had been looking at, at grassroots, we had been looking at some of the communications that we had access to and followed up with a FOIA request to the FTA, uh, which eventually got back to us and told us that they'd never made a determination one way or the other about a plan B. Um, what had happened was a back and forth between the city and the FTA that ended with the city taking up the possibility of a plan B off the table before the FTA ever made a determination as to whether or not they'd be accepted to begin with. So at the, I think the kindest way to interpret it would be to say that Mayor Caldwell was fancy with the facts <laughs> about right. plan B. Well, we won't use metaphors uh, uh, that, like uh, some have used, and we won't use some of the popular phrasing such as fake news and so forth. But we will point out that uh, what you discovered on behalf of Grassroot became breaking news. And we're at a cliffhanger now, and the question is when the legislature resumes uh, its new session, are they going to deal with the fact that they were told something that wasn't factual and use that as the basis for their decision to continue funding the rail. And, and that will be very interesting to see what comes of that. Now let's switch to the Jones Act, which we've been working on for many, many years. And uh, rather than take the moment to sum up what the Jones Act is all about, uh, let's just dive in and, and recognize that the Jones Act does cause prices to go higher than they would be otherwise. But uh, we saw something happen with the recent hurricanes in Florida, Texas, and Puerto Rico. And that was a short-term pullback of, one of, the, of some of the provisions of the Jones Act. Tell us a bit about that and what, what that implies for any change in the Jones well, Act. Mother Nature essentially exposes the problems with the, with the Jones Act, the fact that it limits our ability to respond to emergencies, that it... Uh, limits American shipping, that it makes things more expensive, that it puts people in cutoff areas like islands at a disadvantage when it comes to obtaining goods, that it restricts the flow of vital supplies to areas. When the, Jones, when the hurricanes happened to Texas and Puerto Rico and Florida, uh, one of the very first things the government does is suspend the Jones Act so that we can quickly move necessary supplies to the affected areas without uh, having to worry about whether they're on Jones Act ships and so on and so forth. And it's one of the ways to keep uh, fuel costs from spiraling, to get much-needed supplies to the area quickly. Um, the funny thing is, is that, you know, while I would say an emergency demonstrates that the Jones Act is a hindrance, uh, Jones Act supporters try to say, well, when there's an emergency, we can take it away. I don't find that a very persuasive point of argument. This is always a problem. When things are very serious, we can get rid of it. If it's always a problem, why not get rid of it, period? And that's what the people of Puerto Rico started to say, because Puerto Rico in particular has been in, uh, we'll say, uh, Escalating difficulties. Well, you know, our years and the hurricane really brought that right. home. Right. Uh, we, we at Grassroot have been in regular touch with many people from Puerto Rico. Our policy uh, brothers and sisters over there, members of the government, and so forth. And frankly, Puerto Ricans are feeling hoodwinked by the government. Uh, they cried out that the Jones Act needed to be lifted in, in order for them to get supplies, should they be short of supplies. So the Jones Act was lifted as traditionally it has been by the federal government, for 10 days, and then it came right back into place. But during that time, they didn't need to have the Jones Act lifted. Their, their devastation was so 
uh, monumental at that time that they couldn't get anything from dock to inland. But now that time has passed and they're recovering, they now desperately need supplies that they can't get, and there are supplies stacking up on foreign ports that can't get to Puerto Rico. And we see the problem here of the capriciousness of the argument that says, well, we can always lift the Jones Act in times of emergency, but we see that that is a politically determined solution, and so it's not a long-term solution. The long-term solution would be lift part of the Jones Act permanently so that if an island like and I mean, an island state like Hawaii won't be left to capricious politics at a time of real de 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 devastation. Well, exactly. The, the question about creating an exemption to the Jones Act for Puerto Rico, which has been raised in recent weeks, is not about the emergency. It's about helping the Puerto Rico economy in the long term. It's about saying, hey, you know, this costs Puerto Rico, um, one study put it at about $500 million per year. Uh, this affects the Puerto Rico economy constantly, and in an fragile economy, that's enough. You know, why why let this this very old, desperately in need of modernization law act as a constant anchor on Puerto Rico when even the smallest thing can help? And I would say, and not just Puerto Rico, um, Hawaii, and the U.S. as a whole. You know, why allow a constant drag on the economy only because on the argument that, hey, if there's an emergency, we can we can lift it. Well, what about the constant drag? That's right. Uh, you know, there are there are things that we can do to modernize the Jones Act, to update it, to bring it into the 21st century and help places like Puerto Rico, help places like Hawaii, um, help other places in the United States, because it's not just Puerto Rico and Hawaii that are affected by the act. Um, and help us economically. That's right. And while we're, we're pleased that the Trump administration lifted the, the, the Jones Act uh, for a short period of time, we'd hope that it could last much longer and to be something permanent. Uh, then there is something else that the Trump administration did that let us take advantage of, of an opportunity, and that was Trump's order to the Small Business Administration to hold hearings to look at ways of reducing government regulation. And you helped me to get there in Washington, D.C. and present some testimony before several uh, agencies, about 20 agencies and representatives of the cabinet, in which we made the case that Jones Act is a form of regulation and it needs to be updated and modified. So thanks a lot for letting us do that. That was a significant opportunity. It was, because I think, you know, the hurricanes brought, brought the Jones Act into the national conversation. Um, and that's something that badly needs to be done, because, you know, what we call the Jones Act is, yes, it's the maritime law from 1920, but it's also a, a whole slew of other laws and regulations that have grown up to support it. And, you know, when we talk about reforming the Jones Act, what we're talking about are very small changes that really will open up um, economic advantages for, for places like Hawaii and Puerto Rico. Uh, so it is a form of regulation. It is a form of economic protectionism. And it's not, um, it's not a question of, you know, an all or nothing. Reforming the Jones Act doesn't mean leaving, you know, seamen, American workers high and dry. It doesn't mean leaving right. American seamen, uh, victims of unscrupulous uh, environment or working conditions well, we'll, or we'll anything like that. We'll pick up like on that, that we'll, uh, in an, a future episode. For now, we've come to the conclusion of our time together, and I want to thank you for all the good work you're doing, Malia. And keep it up. Hawaii needs an independent voice, uh, fighting for freer markets, greater liberty, and the opportunities that allow our economy to grow. Thank you very much, Malia. Have a nice Christmas season. Thank you. Well, my guest today, Malia Blomhill, Policy Director of the Grassroot Institute, gave us some updated insights into how Grassroot is fighting on behalf of the people of Hawaii in Washington, D.C. Until next time, I'm Kili'i Akina. This is Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha.